the US dollar is coming to its final end. Building circular economies does work. To spread the right knowledge about Bitcoin is super, super important. If you think you can make a better book, write that book. It is our duty as Bitcoiners. If you can just teach what you know to someone that you know, you know, you're doing your part. If what are you doing to leave the world better than you found it? If we want Bitcoin to work, hodling the Bitcoin, what's that going to do? We need to treat it as capital. We need to be able to spend it. We need to be able to save in it. And I think the mentality to hodl, what's the end goal? You're going to have to spend it eventually. Let's be honest. The ones that survive are the ones that are willing to adapt. Not the smartest, not the strongest, not the prettiest, not, you know, the funniest. Hi, Isa. How are you doing? Everything fine on your end? Everything is perfect. Learning a lot from... Austrian people. <laughs> yeah, we talked before uh, about uh, uh, the, the culture of Austria and, and skiing there. Uh, it's and really the cool. lack of Austrian economics knowledge in Austria. That's a big thing. There's no Austrian economics in, in Austria. Like uh, I didn't know, I learned, the first, like I told you right before we started, uh, I learned about Austrian economics when I encountered Bitcoin before, even though I learned Uh, and studied in Austria, never heard about Austrian economics. Uh, and I thought that Austrian economics is like the economics in Austria currently. And I was like, yeah, it does nothing special about Austria. Uh, but anyways, it's it's a funny story. And I even interviewed people that, that studied economics in Austria, but they never heard about Austrian economics before Bitcoin. So it's 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 interesting. <laughs> How, when did you encounter Austrian economics? Did it Was it with Bitcoin? It was with Bitcoin. I honestly have... I didn't study economics and my view on economics is not the best view. Well, I wouldn't say um, the best because, you know, I'm sorry. <laughs> I, I'm not the smartest one out there, but um, I just have this funny story to tell with, you know, economics professor because my brother is studying economics and I told them ask your professor about Bitcoin and they're teaching them about inflation and about why the dollar is like so good and why you need inflation in order to work and I just thought it was so funny how the professor had no idea about Bitcoin and why he was even looking into it But aside from that, Austrian economics, I discovered it. I haven't gone in into the Austrian economic rabbit hole, I'm not going to lie. Um, I did do an episode on it in Bitcoin Backstage. And I'm not too familiar with with it. So that that's my, my take on Austrian economics. But the first time I heard about it was through Bitcoin. Yeah, you're crazy about uh, educating people, and I love it. And we talked about it before. Uh, you are having the short form co content. I, I prefer a little bit the long form content. I'm like, oh shit, I also have to produce shorts and all that stuff. <laughs> uh, but you also said something. Uh, you you have to grab people's attention. You actually have to get them where they are, and they are uh, at the Instagram reels, they are the YouTube shorts, at the TikToks of the world. Um, why are you like? Let's take a step back. Why are you so um, passionate about educating people about Bitcoin, freedom, inflation, why inflation is not good and all that stuff? Well, I'm very pro-education because at the end of the day, we're not born knowing. So if you know something, obviously, who am I to teach someone? But the thing is, I know more than the normal, than the normal people do about Bitcoin. So if I can teach them what I know, then I'm doing them a service. Um, it's funny, I was just doing another interview and it reminds me because I was talking about why I always like to give back and it all comes down to that. Why am I educating people? Because it's my way of giving back. And I feel like in the Bitcoin industry, we all have to contribute in order for it to work. You know, if you're a coder, you need, you know, you find ways to develop on Bitcoin. If, you know, you know how to do comedy, do comedy based on Bitcoin. Like, what can you bring to the table? Because it's, you know, it's a, a monetary system that will only work if we want it to work. If we want it to stop working, it's not going to work. 
So the idea to spread the right knowledge about Bitcoin is super, super important that I feel like not many people have the ability to learn about Bitcoin. People learn in different ways, whether it's through videos and also through, you know, reading books. And that's why I've always, I've also steered to teach in person and do in-person classes because everybody learns differently. So I think it is our duty as Bitcoiners, if you can just teach what you know to someone that you know, you know, you're doing your part. I saw that. Uh, I, what, is it in El Salvador? What, what are you doing? Like, I, I just saw your pictures where you're like, you have your students and it's in person. I, I love that so much. It is in Isla Mujeres. It's this little island off of the coast of Cancun. And it started out as a passion project, but it's been, I've been pushing forward. Like the first graduating class is going to be this Friday. It was supposed, not this Friday, this Thursday. It was supposed to be Monday, but the students didn't have their final project ready uh, because we had a hurricane coming in. And obviously like, The hurricane trumps everything. So the, they were like, we didn't have time to do our projects because the hurricane came in. So we're going to graduate on Thursday. Oh, interesting. Uh, it's, it's, it's what, what, like, just to give the, the people a, a feeling, what are you doing there? Is like, are you just having a course where there's like the basics of Bitcoin? Uh, or is it more like how to handle Bitcoin with self custody? And like, from what angle are you, uh, explaining them Bitcoin? So I'm teaching them the current curriculum of Mi Primer Bitcoin, and it embarks everything. It embarks what is the, you know, what's the history of money? What is Bitcoin? How does Bitcoin work? And how to self-custody? And it's a 10-week course on every week. Well, I did two classes per week. No, two classes per month for the students. So we started out in April, if I'm not mistaken, And they finally completed the first course. But the idea of the project is to orange pill the whole island. This is just like the beginning phase of the project where I'm teaching them about Bitcoin. And the idea is from that graduating class is I want to select one of the students to come and help me orange pill the whole island. But you got to start somewhere. And I'm starting with the education. How many people on the island? Like, how, how, uh, how many do you have to still educate? Well, there's 22,000 habitants in the island. It's a 14 kilometer by two. And the thing is, it all started when I went to Peru and I did a documentary with Julian about Motif. Motif is a nonprofit organization that's building these circular economies all across Peru. And what he's doing there is God's work. He's using Bitcoin as a tool for freedom, but also that's just only one arm of the tent, like of the octopus. You know, that's one tentacle of the octopus. He's also teaching these people like how to sew, how to build businesses, how to be sovereign individuals. And when I went to see the document, when I went to record the documentary, I was like, this is what I want to do in Islam Credit. That island is small enough for me to start by myself. And it's small enough where there's also tourists that come that can potentially use Bitcoin. And it just has a lot of pros. Obviously, you have the cons that are like the narcos, but it's a good place to start. And I, in my thought, I was like, if I can scale this, then people can probably replicate what I'm doing and see that building circular economies does work. I love it a lot. And I also had uh, from Premier, uh, me, Primero Bitcoin, um, Quentin on, uh, Quentin Ehrenman, I think it's his name, uh, who's yeah, working with them and also told us about like uh, what he's doing with the open source lectures and with the open source of, of, of the education. It's really interesting um, what, what you're doing. It. You, you mentioned circular economy. Um, how, how do you do that? Like, how, how do we... Uh, make more circular economy, get people to spend the Bitcoin. I, I feel like um, 
getting people to spend the Bitcoin is really hard. Like they, they, they want to hold on to them. Well, that's the thing. If we want Bitcoin to work, hodling the Bitcoin, what's that going to do? You know? So obviously, I think we all need to, well, everybody's entitled to do whatever they want. But my thing is, obviously, yes, have your stash that you huddle, but also have, you know, your stash that you save and you start earning in Bitcoin. And I'm no expert. I haven't built a Bitcoin circular economy yet, but there's some out there. And what I've noticed that does work is you have to get the merchants and the people that are buying and selling, you know, take away like everything that you know about Bitcoin and just focus on its core sole purpose for what Satoshi intended it to be, you know, electronic peer-to-peer -peer cash system, eliminating the third, um, the third parties, permissionless, and stick with that. Obviously, I do work a lot with the Lightning Network because the students that I have and where I am located, they, for them to manage and have Bitcoin on chain, is practically impossible. I say impossible because they earn so little that their fees outweigh the money that they have in Bitcoin. So it is not it, like it's not it's not effective for them to maintain their Bitcoin on chain. But anyway, that's besides the point. Um, what I suggest for anybody that wants to do it is you have to talk to the merchants and just have them accept Bitcoin. Them having, like, let's be real, out of 100 customers, probably one of them will pay in Bitcoin. And that doesn't mean that the merchant has to automatically sell that money. You don't want them to sell that Bitcoin for fiat. They just need to, like, stay with it. And then they'll familiarize themselves with the price because all of them are very concerned with the volatility or the scam that go around, you know, Bitcoin, because many people on the island, what I've realized is they get scammed by using the word Bitcoin and they relate it with all the other cryptocurrencies that are out there. So if you can get merchants to accept Bitcoin and you be one of the ones to pay, that's a huge start. It's also for me um, so important that we ask our merchants that we are engaging with merchants every day. Like you go to restaurants, you go to bars, you go to an electronic uh, uh, store, you go, uh, I don't know where, where you go, but you, you go somewhere, you spend your money and everywhere you go and you have especially this personal connection with them at a restaurant, yeah. with the waitress or whatever, um, just ask them, hey, can I be with Bitcoin? And you don't have to be a pain in the ass with that. You just like have to like, Hey, can I pay with Bitcoin? And then she's just like, no. And like, okay, perfect. Then can I pay yeah. with ca cash or card? Like, just, but just a question. Like, think about uh, what this will do to the staff of that restaurant if, if they get that question like five, six times a week. Then all of a sudden, they're like, maybe we should look into that. Maybe we should uh, talk, uh, we should talk about that. And then they, uh, familiarize them with them like they get maybe some someone in that can help them with that uh, like there's so many uh, um, vendors there's so many people that help uh, you to onboard bitcoin in your stores like uh, i feel like that's a, a really underrated way to drive bitcoin adoption yeah it's super underrated that you can do on your own and one thing that you will realize is a lot of people are intimidated by bitcoin like, oh, or they're like, it's too late. I already missed the bus. I'm not going to invest. Or I, you know, I can't afford one full Bitcoin. So there are these misconceptions that need to be addressed. And sometimes, like, if they do say something like that, it is, you know, you should speak up about it, you know, and be like, address. Sorry, is that I'm in a public place? I'm in a house. <laughs> So people will be moving around my where that. No, um, no, no worries. At least for me, not. <laughs> and then the dogs. <laughs> but that that's something that I would say. You, you don't have to do a Bitcoin circular economy. You just have to start with the nearest merchant that you have. You know, that coffee shop that you go all the time. And it's easier if you know the owner. What do I mean by if you know the 
the owner. You don't have to be friends with them. Just talk to them. Normally, they're already there and they're running the businesses. I'm not saying like Starbucks, but there's small businesses everywhere. So if you do go to a small business, they're mostly the ones to accept Bitcoin. There's already like three in three places, three restaurants in Yuga Mujeres that accept Bitcoin because I talk to the owners directly. So it's not just about going, hey, just to the waiter or to like the guy that brings you the check. It's like, you know, ask always oh, the owner here by any chance. I wanted to ask him a couple questions. Normally they're they want their business to succeed and nobody's gonna say no to money. That that's a thing. Especially when we come to the point where Bitcoiners are starting to be um knowing what wh where are the coffee shops they accept bitcoin like there's the the bitcoin map and there's like all those apps where you can actually look Wh when when we get to a point where bitcoiners are like i want to spend my bitcoin and i only go to the coffee shops that accept bitcoin then it's like real grassroots movement yeah. because as you said those the starbucks those mcdonald's they probably do it once they have to do it like once it's legal law or, or like they, they see such a big amount But the small coffee shops, like it's not that complicated to accept Bitcoin. It's like you have to talk to your, to your tax consultant. You you have to set up like a device. It's 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 nothing that cannot be done for a business person. For the businesses and people are like, they'll normally ask you like, oh, how do I accept it? Or they, if they do have a wallet, it's probably norm most likely it's wallet of Satoshi or in my case, it's uh, Bitso. I do recommend to also research about coinos.io because it's a lightning wallet that it's the best. It's non-KYC and it works flawlessly. Obviously, it has some issues, but it gets the job done and you can set it up as a merchant. And what do I mean that like you can set it up as a merchant is that it allows the let's say that the coffee shop it allows the owner to have on his phone the main coinos account and then all the people that are going to you know collect the check they can have you know exact they can have access to the coinos without taking away bitcoin they can only accept bitcoin that's mm. super interesting that, that that's a uh, cool insight Do you think that Bitcoin needs that? Like, do you think that the circle economy that we spend our Bitcoin is, is necessary to drive adoption or can it also be just like we hold it? No, obviously we need it. If we want hyper Bitcoinization, then I think we need to treat it as cash. Not cash, but as, you know, yeah, as cash. We need to be able to spend it. We need to be able to save in it. And I think the mentality to hodl, like, what, what's the end goal? You know, you're going to have to spend it eventually. So I think instead of spending it, because I don't know what people's plans are when you hodl so much money. Like, is your plan to then convert it into fiat or wait for everybody else, you know, to do the heavy lifting and convince, you know, merchants to accept Bitcoin And then you can spend your Bitcoin. We're like, what What are people waiting for? I think it's a huge job for all the Bitcoiners to make sure that we are making the big, like the make the Bitcoin that we use and, you know, that we have. If you're a business owner, offer the ability to pay your employees in Bitcoin. You know, I know that's a huge barrier sometimes. Companies don't want to pay their employees in Bitcoin or they don't want to receive Bitcoin, but they're Bitcoin companies. And you're like, brother, come on, you know, try to adapt and, you know, not like let's leave the fiat system in a way. When do you think, um, do you have a time frame or obviously it's impossible to, to predict anything, but do you have a framework where you think of like, When this happens or at this time, we might be actually able as society to leave the, the fear system. I myself don't think we can completely 
um, live it in my lifetime. I'm now 25, yeah. so like when I live another 75 years, um, it, it, it's hard for me to imagine. But then there are people coming in my podcast saying like, oh, Fiat will be gone in five years. And I'm like, uh, how? <laughs> no. uh, do, do you have like a time frame or like a framework to think about that or what? Or, or like an event that has to happen in order to, to get rid of fiat system? Well, I think a catastrophe has to happen in order for us to leave the fiat system. I think we're entering this battle with, you know, the governments and the big corporations because in a way, Bitcoin is a silent revolution and they're starting to realize how powerful Bitcoin is. And the people that are in power... They're not just going to give up their power just like that. We're talking about decades, decades and hundreds and hundreds of years of these people being in power, the same families being in power. They're not just going to get up and be like, here, take it. No, it's going to be a fight and it's not going to go easy. And it's something that I agree. I don't think we'll see it in our lifetime because it's it comes down to with how people are born. I think it is up to the new generation that's growing up, being born with Satoshi's gift. It's their dude. They're the ones that are going to be able to maybe see the end of the fiat system. But I don't think we will. It's, I think a lot. I mean, hopefully we do see it, you know, eventually. We never know how things work, especially in technology. The Time flies in technology. I think a year in Bitcoin is like equivalent to five years in, you know, the fiat system. But something probably really, really bad has to happen for the fiat system to end. And it always does. Like, you know, I think the U.S. dollar is coming to its final end, especially since it's became, you know, the global money and monetary system. So like a lifeline of about what, like a hundred years. So... It it could end it could end uh, soon. Uh, that that's yeah. that's why I'm so confused in my head. Like at some point, I I see that argument for fiat collapsing quite soon because uh, you already have inflation. But like all the small things that happen, all the events that happen, it trickles down. Like uh, COVID was just the first event that happened that triggered mm -hmm. a lot of money printing. What when? next year something else happens they they figure something else out like what like whatever does and there, there's some catastrophe then they spend uh, more like like every time we spend we have to spend so much more than before because we have to pay the interest on everything um it's 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 hard for me to, to grasp the 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 head around how they will survive 70 years but, but I, I, I do not think so i think it's there's a difference between the end of the U.S. dollar and then the end of the fiat system. Like the end of the U.S. dollar doesn't mean that because if, if it collapses, then automatically the fiat system is going to end. And I think we can see a lot of that be like all these other countries like China and Russia, they're all trying to build their own CBDCs. That's still fiat, even though it's not physical, they're still got. Like, that's still a form of fiat system. And eventually, it'll work for them. And I don't know when that end will be, though. Because going against Russia and China, oh, my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> that, that one's going to be rough. I, I don't know it. what's scarier, the United States, Russia, or China. What are you saying? Like for the any any fights, you know what I mean. They're like the 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 pure evil powerhouses that are scary. <laughs> Which one do you think is is most scary? Like uh, U.S. Or, or or China and Russia combined? <laughs> oh my gosh! Well, the thing is, Russia and China, you know that what you're getting into. They're they're like, hey, we're communists. You know what I mean? Like this is what we are. They have the whole thing. But then the United States, they're sneaky about it. They're like, oh, we don't control you guys. And then all of a sudden you have everything that they're controlling us. You know, I don't know. I think in a way the United States is scarier because you don't know what is happening behind the scenes. 
while Russia and China, they're very, you, you know what you would be getting yourself into. Well, I don't know, what do you think? Uh, it's a re really hard one. Like right now, I think uh, America has the advantage. Like they, they are the, it's really hard to say like China, there are so many people also like Russia and China combined. They are so much bigger also than, than, than America. It's, uh, it's it's really but hard they to have suppressed people though. That's the thing. Yeah, and they they don't have uh, yeah. Still, uh, it's it's interesting. Yeah, I still would feel like America is stronger. Yeah, yeah. Actually, what do you think is the um, the freest country of the world? Like, where, where would like a freedom Bitcoin loving person, um, uh, or like a freedom, like I think a, a Bitcoin loving person, it would be very. Uh, declined to do to like El Salvador and something like that, but a freedom uh, is is there something else? You, I think if the most free would be living on an island. You don't realize how free it is and how you don't have any laws, and you honestly can do whatever you want. So I think to be like, hey, this country, that would be a disservice because. I feel like all islands, in a way, they govern themselves. They're so secluded from the mainland that sometimes they're even, you know, they're they're forgotten in a way. So I think if someone wants to be free, being on an island away from the real world, that's where you will find freedom. It's it's like that fifth child that. Uh... Uh, where the parents are don't uh, are governing the child that much as like the first child. <laughs> exactly. The last one, they're like, yeah, do whatever you want. They're the most forgotten, overseen. Um, because at the end of the day, the country is going to care about like the main country, you know, like look at Roatan. Roatan even has their, they even have their own, um, like their, what's it called? Their own, they have their own, it, it has a special word. But Ruatan has an area that it's like has their own laws that the country laws from Honduras can't even access them. It has a name, but I mean, their own really, ju jurisdiction or their like own jurisdiction and everything. It's crazy. Wow. Like Ruatan is super, super interesting. And that goes to show all the islands, they have their own type of, you know, little community and little governance that they can do. Yeah, Roatan is, is interesting. I, I think we are even like talked three, four times already on the podcast about that with different guests. Did you wear uh, there uh, personally? The what? Uh, did, did you wear on, on Roatan already? No, or like... no, not yet. I do want to go. Um, what, what did you say before where you made the documentary? Was it Peru or was it something, some other place? Yeah, it was Peru. Uh, I did a documentary there with Modif and their nonprofit organization that they've built over 16 circular economies. What is, uh, like, why Peru and what, 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 what do you, especially in Latin America, I don't know if you were probably were already in El Salvador, I guess. No. You were not in El Salvador? No, wow. I still haven't been to El Salvador. Oh, now I feel better myself that I wasn't <laughs> there yet. <laughs> No, I I haven't been to El Salvador. Hopefully, I'll be soon to experience it, but not um, Peru. Well, I did the documentary because I'm Peruvian, and that's one of the reasons why Julian reached out to me. He's like, hey, you're a Bitcoiner. You're Peruvian. You know, let's go do a documentary in Peru and cover this really great things about, you know, what Motive is doing. Uh, but Motive chose Peru because the guy that's on the ground, his name is Valen. He's actually from Romania, but he moved to Argentina when he was 18 to escape communism. And he ended up in Peru for some reason. So he's not even Peruvian and he's doing insane things and helping the community. And he actually stumbled across Bitcoin because he was always doing, um, he was always giving back and volunteering. And it was during the pandemic that he needed to get food to 
you know, the people like the like in the poor communities. And the only person that would donate during the pandemic was a Bitcoiner. Nobody knows who the Bitcoiner was, but the Bitcoiner only requested for him. He's like, hey, I'll give you Bitcoin. Obviously, you guys need to fact check this. I'm just summarizing this, you know, as, as best as I can. But the idea for it was Valen received this huge donation in Bitcoin, but his the only thing he needed to do was find merchants that accepted Bitcoin in order for him to buy. So he had to like orange pill merchants to accept Bitcoin for him to actually create these baskets and give the food to the people that he was supposed to do. So that's how he actually became a Bitcoiner. Thank you. You already made it halfway through the video and I'm really, really grateful to have you here. Two things make this channel possible. You as a watcher and listener who keep supporting this channel. And another one is all the Bitcoin brands that I partner up with, like 21Bitcoin, who support me from the very start and where I personally buy my Bitcoin from. With Code Robin, you even get a discount when you buy Bitcoin with them. And now also Bitbox. Bitbox is the simplest and securest way to secure your Bitcoin. And I heard a crazy statistics. Only 2% of Bitcoiners hold their Bitcoin in a hardware wallet. How crazy is that? Don't be in that 98% bracket. Be in the 2% bracket. And if you have self-custody and you know your friend does not have, maybe he needs a Christmas present. Maybe he needs a birthday present. And a small life hack. If you use code ROBIN, you get 5% off your order plus you support my channel and uh, now let's get back to the video so wait did he got a uh, bitcoin from a donator uh and then uh in order to buy something from that he needed to the merchants to accept them like why did, why did he not want to exchange it for fiat because the that was the donor's request for him to use the bitcoin like instead of selling he's like no if you like, I'm donating this. The only way is you have to figure out, you know, what you're gonna do with the money. You've got to buy the stuff that you're gonna give to the, um, to the people using the Bitcoin. Oh, that's that's beautiful. That's a great Bitcoin mind right there. Like yeah. He, he he was thinking like he was not like ah, I only want to give Bitcoin. I want to give Bitcoin with that condition, so we can actually drive Bitcoin adoption there. Um, what do you think, like, when you're now, like, you're from Peru then? Yes, uh, I uh, am from Peru. A really, really cool. Uh, what can those countries, like, I feel like those countries can especially benefit from, from Bitcoin, yeah. uh, even more than the US or uh, Europe right now. Like, everyone will uh, benefit from Bitcoin in a certain extent, but especially, like, Latin America, I feel like, can have a huge advantage if they're early now to Bitcoin. Well, these countries um, are a lot overlooked and they're actually the best ones to adopt it quickly without asking options. It's like that bell curve, you know, the normal people don't get it, but those outliers are the ones that get it the most. And I realize that in third world countries, they need a lifeline. So when you throw them this lifeline, which is Bitcoin, they won't grab onto it. And there's a lot of people in the industry that I've noticed that are from Venezuela, that are, you know, from Brazil, that are from El Salvador, that have no other options. So they automatic, like they've been pushed to choose Bitcoin. And in Europe and in the United States, it's an option. So it's like, yeah, you have it there if you ever need it, but they don't have the necessity to use it. And the thing is, in these third world countries, the government has neglected them so much. Like, there's people that are that don't have a bank account, that they're unbanked. And I'm not saying that I'm like pro bank, but it's also easier in a way to go from not having a bank account and using cash to just using Bitcoin. Because a lot of what I've noticed is when I talk to people that have gone to college, that have studied, you know, until they were 18 years of age, they're automatically asking like, oh, what is money? You know, what is Bitcoin backed by? Or, 
you know, how can you use it if it doesn't come with a bait? And it's kind of like they need to unlearn everything they've learned and that they were taught because they were, you have to look in like, who is the ones that, you know, taught you all of this? And in a way, they've been indoctrinated to think this type of way. So if you go to the people that are, have been neglected by the system, you can actually teach them the right way. And when I mean teach them is you give them the options so they can choose what they want. You know, it's never you never like obligate someone, hey, you got to use, you know, Bitcoin. But it's like, no, like this is an option for you that you can, you know, send your money to someone that lives, you know, thousands of miles away without you even having a bank account and having to ask for permission to use your own hard-earned money. That, that's that's really interesting that um, people that are not banked are like close to the Bitcoin because they don't have to unlearn that whole fiat uh, clown show that, 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 that they learn so so nicely. And it's, it's like, yeah, like for me, it was not easy to... We got like, oh, where do I get Bitcoin? And like, why do I need some some separate device to store it? Like all my other stocks and everything else is like in my brokerage. Like, why why do I need an extra device for that? That's that's interesting. No, one hundred percent. And it's the response. Oh, when I was going to this documentary in Peru, my parents were like, "How are they having Bitcoin? Like, they don't have bank accounts." And you're like, "You don't need a bank account." to have Bitcoin. Like people forget that you can earn Bitcoin by doing work. You can get paid in Bitcoin, you know? You can figure out how to, you know, spend it. But sometimes I think we always so always talk about, you know, buying in the dip and buying Bitcoin and stacking sads. But there are people out there that, you know, do work for Bitcoin. There's actually this guy on Twitter that I follow that he started selling baklava for Bitcoin in like 2010. So it's, you just have to be creative in a way and figure out, you know, what you can do to earn Bitcoin. You don't necessarily have to, you know, spend, you know, buy it in Strike or all these wallets that all these exchanges yeah that's that's a profitable business starting selling anything in in bitcoin, in, bitcoin. Uh, in 2010 <laughs> right yeah. that, that's a great business model right there that's that's a that's a crazy thought i i, I love it a lot with what, what you're saying it gives me a lot to think about um like only because I'm, I'm curious. Did you ever experience with altcoins? Did you ever go to that 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 altcoin route, or did you stick with with Bitcoin from the beginning? No, I think I learned so later on. I learned in 2021 about Bitcoin, and the people that introduced me to Bitcoin, they're hardcore Bitcoin maxis, and they went to. I think they also experienced with altcoins. I don't know their backdrop journey but they made sure that i was like full of bitcoin only and they taught me and they explained to me why and why is bitcoin different than all these other chains blockchain tokens whatever you want to call them from the get-go and i think that's a lot of people get into bitcoin for you know they come in for the gains but most of them stay for, you know, the revolution. And I was taught super early what Bitcoin stood for. And I'm very loyal. So if I like something, I'm going to go and stick to it. So I didn't have that ability to go out and wander with, you know, Ethereum or all the other type of coins. But I would have to say is... I don't know if it would have been different if I would have gone into Bitcoin if it was lower. I got in, in Bitcoin in peak bull market. You know, it was 69000 in 2021 when I invested all my money into it. So I was like, hell no, I am not selling anything. I do not want, like, if I don't sell, I'm not losing anything. And that gave me enough of a time to learn myself more about Bitcoin. And once you know, 
and you agree like i don't know you have to be blind not to agree with what bitcoin stands for but the more i learned the more i realized that this is more than just you know an electronic cash system that's why i never sold and i always stacked and stacked but i mean i mean i i stacked what i could i'm not like a bitcoin millionaire or anything but that's one thing that i think it was kind of like a blessing in disguise you know to enter when it was super high because i learned a lot <laughs> Yeah, it's uh, you, you. You always enter at a height, and then you have to learn uh, for four or five years to be patient. Yes, <laughs> it's uh, it, it's a great way to enter. I feel like it's it, it strengthens your uh, belief in it. Uh, it strengthens your abilities, uh, and and you don't get like oh, what should I do when the price moves? like I think like peak of the uh, bull market or like the 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 bear market was really silent the, those are the two best times to enter because in the bear market there's not a lot happening there's not a lot of trauma you just enter price is not doing a lot of things uh, that's a great uh, way to get or like when you invest and you're like oh shit it's going down 50 percent i don't want to lose anything now I, I okay. that's that's a that's a great way um i always ask uh nowadays chat gpt before i go to the podcast what i should what i should ask my my <laughs> guest about and uh i don't know maybe he made a, a, a wrong research but uh he said i should ask you about art and what what role bitcoin and art plays I, are you a big fan of art uh, um actually yes i like art i actually make some for fun and I don't know what role Bitcoin plays. Um, it's I don't have um, what what are the new uh, ordinals? It's not that I have ordinals or anything, but I have made art and sold it for Bitcoin before, so that that's fun. The actual art, like physical art. physical or... arts, yeah, physical okay. arts, <laughs> yeah, yeah. It was like, I almost forgot the names, but because I know now there's like ordinals and everything, but. With art, I think I did, I'm not gonna lie. I did like the idea of NFTs. The idea of them was super interesting for artists because it gave the artist the opportunity to build a community, and not many creators, you know, get recognition. So it was a cool concept, but I think involving in into bitcoin i don't know I, honestly like i i don't i'm not an expert i would lie if i said i was but i if you can make art and sell it for bitcoin why not you know i used to make 3d art and well i still make some but so right now my hands are a little full building the the bitcoin school in china orange Belly island but i've made some custom pieces and stuff uh Yeah, it's it, that's an interesting debate with with NFTs because um, art is always subjective, uh, mm -hmm. and people are like, oh, how can you pay like millions of dollars for a monkey picture? And and I'm like, it it is their choice. Like it's it's yes. like in a free market. Like the free market sets the price, and if someone is willing to pay that. It might be a stupid decision overall because maybe he loses 90% or like maybe 100% of it, but it's still valid. Like uh, like the Bitcoin incentivizes the free market. So if, if there's some some NFTs on top of Bitcoin, I would never engage in that. Like I, I don't care about that at all. But if someone does, like go for it. And and also like when 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 they are an attack on bitcoin because some people also are, uh, like argue oh they are attack on bitcoin and yeah, then let's let's attack it <laughs> like uh, the, bitcoin is attacked since day one like everyone always attacked bitcoin mm -hmm. uh, in 2013 china joined with without attacking bitcoin they still try they still fail like attacking bitcoin is what what bitcoin is uh, famous for like they, it is it always has been attacked and it always gets stronger with it That's the key word. It gets stronger with it. And I think in order for us to, you know, reach hyper Bitcoinization and, you know, have 8 billion people on the system, 
we need to find its holes. We need to find what's wrong with it for it to, you know, adapt and to evolve. Because at the end of the day, I guess, I know, like, let's be honest, the ones that survive are the ones that are willing to adapt. Not the smartest, not the strongest, not the prettiest, not, you know, the funniest. It's the one that's most able to adapt to whatever situation it's put in. And I think putting Bitcoin through all these tests, not like these tests, but that it's thrown into these, you know, examples like with the ordinals and it comes and it still works and it can, you know, improve the system and how it works. That's what's going to allow Bitcoin to, you know, be able to, be able for 8 billion people to use the system because before, you know, there was not such, uh, there was no such thing as a lightning network. And, you know, if you look back four years ago or six years ago, you had to use Bitcoin transactions on, using on chain. And even Satoshi in one of like his talks, he says that in order for it to work, we need to learn how to scale it down and use Bitcoin and not use so many fees. So I think the Lightning Network uses a really good um, alternative, even though it has its like bad sides. But that's what we're here to do. You know, that's why it's open source for everybody to improve it and make it better. Yeah, I feel like the the scaling Bitcoin is a really interesting one. I try to figure it out and that's why I invite people that are smarter than me because I don't have a clue how to scale Bitcoin uh, that's why I ask like people from the Lightning Network uh, people that are for the Fediments, uh, people are for uh, Liquid, for all those uh, different uh, things like from Arc, I also had someone on now mm -hmm. uh, Yeah. Uh, so like so many people and the, the thing that I kind of is like everyone agrees on, like we cannot build everything on Lightning, uh, yeah. but Lightning might be the, the high, the super highway between uh, like an arc or between a Fediment. And then with Fediment, we, we really spend our Bitcoin, but we have our Lightning wallets with like a Lightning bank or whatever. Like th those are like really abstract things that I'm just saying now, <laughs> but uh I think it's in, in but we need to try them in order to see if that they work like they can't just be left with ideas you know so i think sometimes people get so caught up in the in bitcoin that they're like it has to be how it is and we need to find other solutions to make it more acceptable for other people to onboard and use bitcoin yeah uh, and uh the I, I love the thing that you said with adopting it's, it's for me it's like bitcoin is almost like water and like you push it everywhere and it's just like it flows where it has to flow <laughs> like it's so it's an, ama an amazing thing i Did like that you... it's like i've heard the phrase you know you got to be like water you put it in a cup it'll fit in the cup you put it in a plate it'll fit in the plate yeah I, i'm uh I, I like that a lot because i think it comes from some some kung fu fight or yeah. some, something like that like i heard that and i resonated so much with that because i'm a swimmer like i uh, swim since all my life like since i'm like four years old or something like that i was a professional swimmer at national level in austria uh, and like water is such an amazing comparison because you can punch it all you want it will volatile like it, it will have some waves but after a while it will be still it will be just that's, like before and that's like kind of bitcoin you can punch it you can attack it but after a while it just still and it, it just does uh, does it its thing it's it's a, a wonderful comparison i like that i never thought about it like that i thought it was putting it in a cup but that is so true you have like tsunamis and then the calmness or like the calm before the storm yeah and water is amazing <laughs> <laughs> Let's drink more water. <laughs> um, the the last thing that I want to get into with, with you is, uh, no, actually, I, maybe I have a second thing, depending on, on how long we talk about that. Um, you have Get Based, and you make so many interesting videos, and you make the, the opposite videos that I do. Like I do very long-form videos, but uh, I mean, I, I don't know, you, you probably also do 
do do you do any long form videos also? Uh, the, like off thirty minutes or something like that. The long form videos are the documentaries that we oh, do, wow. and yeah, they range. They're either from twenty to forty five minutes. But I like to stick more to the short term content. You know, one minute videos. I'm starting this new project called BTC Isla, where I explain what I'm doing on the island. And that still, it's going to be short content. It's going to be three to seven minute long videos um, because I believe we've steered to like, I don't know, I, I really like fast paced content and to be able to put the ideas that you have in like three to seven minutes. And yep. <laughs> That, that, that was your question, right? If I do long term, I do both. I do a little bit of everything. Yeah, it is. It, 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 my, my, my question with where I, I wanted to go is um, what is get based? I think you are involved with that with, with yeah. Julian also. Yeah. Uh, who, who else is there involved? And like, uh, what are you doing with, with, with get based? What's the goal of it? So, get based is a production agency and a content creation agency. We started in February, like we, we decided to launch this project in January. And it started because when I was doing the Peru doc, Julian and I realized we worked really well together and we wanted to create content and not have to ask permission, not have to beg for sponsors, you know, to give us the funding to create this great ideas. So we realized we wanted to work together because we had these visions that we can, you know, like that phrase, it, you work, it takes a village, you know, there's so much that you can do by yourself, but with other people to help you, you can achieve whatever you want easier and faster. And Julian had also done another documentary with Adam. And I think they went to Guatemala together and they also wanted to do something together. So when Julian met me, I was kind of like the missing piece of the puzzle. And we decided to create Get Based, which is this company that we help other companies build their community, their build their communities through fearless storytelling. So our idea and our vision is to awaken the sovereign individual and be able to like push them to their limits and you know create do we just had a, like a huge long meeting today about our vision i don't know why i'm blanking out <laughs> but the idea for it is for us to create content that inspires other people but at the same time makes them feel good and we not only do it for ourselves we have where we create our shows we have future proof we had wrong think but um, with Wrong Think, we're switching it up. We're doing BTC Isla, and we have the documentaries where we either go to different parts of the world to explore how Bitcoin adoption has made it a thing, or we do these crazy, you know, mind and body uh, crushing experiments. And we also offer the part where we help other companies create that content and we do the heavy lifting for them. You know, because if you're a company, let's say you're a wallet, you want to focus on being the best wallet that there is out there. You don't have time in your hands to, you know, drift off and build that community or, you know, create that content. So we want to take that and do it for them. I, I love it a lot. It, uh, I think a lot of Bitcoin com uh, companies need that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and also based companies. It doesn't have to be a Bitcoin company. At the end of the day, we are looking for people that have that vision and that future and that hope, you know. And obviously, yes, Bitcoin companies, but also, you know, that farmer that is selling, you know, really good meat across the street from you we want those types of people as clients too because they're bitcoiners without knowing that they're bitcoiners 
Then, then you can also orange peel them. Uh, it's, yes, it's in the process. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing, I love it. Perfect. Then uh, closer to the end routine, um, one question that uh, every all, all of my guests are getting. Um, what can we learn from you besides Bitcoin and what we talked about already? What can they learn from me? I guess to just start now. Um, a lot of us don't think that, oh, we always expect someone else to do what we want to do. Like, let's say for teaching, you know, we're like, ah, oh, people should, you know, make better books about Bitcoin. So then maybe other people can learn. It's like, no, if you, if you think you can make a better book, write that book, do that book. You know, if, what are you doing to leave the world better than you found it? Try to help and don't put limits on yourself. You know, don't wait until like the moment is perfect for you to start. Like if I'm going to write that book, I need it to be perfect. No, just start writing it. Everything's going to fall into place eventually. I love that a lot. Uh, it's it's like starting it, uh, getting the courage. Uh, I, I talked before with Alexander Svetsky and we, we had a similar similar talk in the middle of the, the podcast and, and I loved it a lot. And, and it was just like an hour before you also something like that. Uh, it's a great topic that we can in, get into. Um, but now to the end routine, the actual end routine of the podcast, where we have the question from the previous guest, uh, like the, the previous guest asked a question for you without knowing who the next guest is actually is. So without knowing who you are. Um, and your question from the previous guest is, if someone gifted you 1,000 Bitcoin, what would you do with them? 1,000 Bitcoin? What would I do with 1,000 Bitcoin? Uh, first of all, that would be super nice. <laughs> <laughs> and <Thank you. laughs> yeah, I'd be like, thank you. What did I do to deserve this? Um, I would honestly just right now, because I'm thinking of what I'm doing right now, I would continue to expand Bitcoin Isla and expedite BTC Isla because we need, you know, it needs funds in order to work because people don't want to work for free. So it's hard for me to recruit people without me offering them something in return other than, you know, so for me, that would expedite the process of orange pilling the island and making it possible so I can offer Bitcoin courses after school. Because in Bitcoin, I, in Isla Mujeres, the school system is from 7 to 11 a.m. So it would be perfect to have an after school program, teach English to the kids and also about Bitcoin. And obviously the plan would be to orange fill the taxi mafia because there's a huge taxi mafia on the island too. Uh, but that's where I would put all the sads to, to make that Bitcoin circular economy work. Well, what's the story behind the taxi mafia? That sounds interesting. Oh my gosh. So in this island, how I told you guys, you know, if you want to be free, go to an island. But there's also a lot of monopolies. And it's very hard to come in as an outsider and start your own business and, you know, do anything. And on the island, there's many mafias, as in the taxi mafia, where they're this whole union, you cannot become a taxi driver without their approval. You know, they're the only form of transportation. Like there is no way Uber is going to exist on this island. The, they recently added public transportation, one huge bus that takes you from one end of the island to the other. And the first couple of months where the government, the, the people there added the bus system, the taxi drivers would beat the living hell out of the taxi, of, uh, well, out of the bus driver. So they're not very um, keen to welcoming new businesses that is going to take away from them. Like on this island, there's not that many cars. So they use a lot of golf carts. And if you, let's say, are a hotel and you want to offer a golf cart business, like, you know, offer your guests golf cart services, you can't. 
So it's kind of crazy how it works. So, so even though it's a very free island, um, you see that there are there's maybe a need for someone uh, to come in and make a non-monopoly market uh, yeah. possible. Well, it's free, but it's not a free market <laughs> yet. So <laughs> free, but not a free market. Yeah. So there is obviously there there the leaders are not you know the big corporations and the government. They're morally like cartels and business owners. That so. <laughs> Interesting, Anna. Yeah, it's human nature to auto ha need someone to lead a community. So I think that's that's one thing is certain. There's always going to be a leader in a community, someone that's going to you know take care of the people in a way, and we can see it with that. <laughs> Ab absolutely, uh, it's the, that is very interesting, perfect. But. Uh... Uh, before I let you go and before I forget, uh, where can people find you? Where can people ask you questions, reach out to you? What's the best place for that? The best place. So I am on Noster. I am, you can, I think my name in Primal is Isabella at Primal.net. Um, then you can follow me on Instagram. You can follow me. On Twitter, my Instagram is Isabella Santos TV. My Twitter or X is Isabella SG3. And also, if you can follow Get Based, that would be amazing. Get Based has a YouTube and a Twitter. That that would be based if you follow yes. Based. <laughs> It would be very based. And thank you so much for having me, Robin. Thank you, Isabella, for joining me. Also, thank you for everyone watching and listening for joining us today. I'll be back tomorrow, as always, with another episode. Bye-bye.